Hello. So my name is Tim Hanks. Uh, I'm a faculty member here, assistant professor at UC Davis in the Department of Neurology. And my lab is based over here at the Center for Neuroscience. And the focus of the research in my lab is to try to understand how the brain makes decisions and to use that knowledge to try to pave the way towards the directed treatment of disorders of brain function. As we all know, decision making is absolutely central to everything that we do. From our daily routines to our long term plans, the decisions that we make shape the directions of our lives. Some of these decisions may seem relatively minor in consequences, such as the choices we make about what movies to watch at night, what parking spots to select, and what clothes to wear. But over time, even these small decisions add up and really make a difference in the long term. Just think about the daily decisions you make about all the food that you eat, or perhaps more importantly, the food that you shouldn't eat, and how much this matters for our long-term health. In addition to these smaller decisions that really do make a difference, we're also faced in our lives a number of times with much larger decisions that have even longer lasting consequences. For example, the decision I made to start a family has had an impact on nearly every aspect of my life since I made that choice. This is a picture of my son, one month of age, now nearly 10 years ago. So I think we can all relate to these sorts of decisions that really have shaped who we are as people here today. And I think the importance of decision making really goes without any doubt. Now all the decisions that we make are ultimately borne out through brain activity. Brain activity allows us to process information about the world around us. Brain activity allows us to make decisions based on that information. And brain activity allows us to coordinate our actions and movements based on those decisions. As a society, though, why should we care about how the brain makes decisions? There are a number of potential answers to this question, but one of the answers is the importance of decision making to human health and well-being. When you look at disorders of brain function, a number of these disorders have impairments to decision making, and oftentimes these impairments can be absolutely debilitating. So when you think about disorders such as Alzheimer's or depression, or as Steve talked about schizophrenia, oftentimes we see that individuals affected really have problems with their decision making. And I would argue that one of the largest negative life impacts of many of these disorders comes about through dysfunctional decision making. So the importance of decision making for human health and well-being is really quite clear. This is even more clear when we think about the numbers of people who are affected by this, these sorts of disorders, which are absolutely staggering. By some estimates, over 50 million Americans have a disorder of brain function, with a cost to our economy of estimated to be around $1.5 trillion per year. At a more global level, the World Health Organization estimates that around one third of all years lost to death and disability worldwide are on account of disorders of brain function. So when I hear these numbers, I really think that they're mind boggling. But at the same time, they don't fully capture the true essence of the impact of these disorders. To do that, you need to think about the personal toll exacted by many of them. So I hope you don't mind. I want to tell a personal story real quick about how brain disorders have affected my life. So this is the story of my dad. Uh, during my childhood, my dad was highly functioning. He was extremely friendly, and he was a successful business person. In his late 50s, his personality changed very dramatically and noticeably. He became less friendly, he became, less, he became more easily agitated, he became more easily angered. His memory was relatively preserved, but he started to make really terrible decisions, both large and small. Eventually, this led him to lose his job when he should have been in his working prime. At age 60, he was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia. He didn't want to see a doctor. I had to fly out there and actually intervene and drag him to the doctor to get a diagnosis. And things spiraled downhill quickly thereafter. At age 63, he needed full-time professional care just to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. And he passed away at age 65, only five years after his initial diagnosis and less than 10 years after he started to develop the signs and symptoms of dementia. And this was something that didn't just affect my dad. It affected everyone around, it, around him. It affected me, it affected my siblings, it affected my dad's coworkers, friends, and acquaintances, and most especially it affected my mom. And so when I think about the personal impact of brain disorders, this is what really shapes my perspective, and it shapes my perspective on the difference that we can make. 
So there are many ways that we could make a difference. Why do I focus on neural mechanisms? Well, the truth is that a large part of this focus has nothing to do with my dad whatsoever. It's that my lifelong passion has been to try to understand how this organ, the human brain, what I think is the most amazing thing in the known universe, brings about mental function. The human brain consists of about 80 billion nerve cells or neurons connected to each other in elaborate neural circuits. In these neural circuits, this is the level at which much of the focus of the research in my, in, in my lab is uh, focused on, is trying to understand neural circuit mechanisms. Within these neural circuits, nerve cells communicate with each other at junctions called synapses, as illustrated in this cartoon schematic here on the right. And communication at these synapses is mediated by chemical messengers in this cartoon, these little red dots, that are released by one nerve cell and in turn have effects on recipient nerve cells. Within the brain, these neural circuits are highly organized, intricate, and refined. And yet, many of the treatments for disorders of brain function, while effective, are blunt tools that affect chemical messengers on a global scale and long time scales across the entire brain. As an analogy, this would be like trying to improve your cooking by increasing the amount of salt you put in every dish that you make and buy the same amount. You may be able to improve some of the ones that aren't as good, but at the same time, you're going to make others worse. That is, it's not surprising if there are side effects. And this is even more apt when we extend the analogy to the brain, which is vastly more complicated. So while existing tools, medication-based treatments can be effective, they are blunt tools. So it's difficult to use them to repair the complex, intricate circuitry that underlies many of these different disorders. Instead, what we really need are treatments with greater precision in location and time of action. What we need are treatments that are focused on the neural circuits responsible for these disorders. And I believe that we can get there. How do we get there? By focusing on neural mechanisms. So one answer to this question of why we should focus on these mechanisms is it will allow us to best find potential clinical interventions that can help to improve disorders of brain function. In my lab, this focus is brought to bear on questions of neural mechanisms responsible for decision making. So to illustrate the types of questions that we address in the lab, let me start with a simple example that comes from everyday life. As I told you, I'm a parent, and so when my kids were younger, I would oftentimes be woken up in the middle of the night by mysterious noises. I think we can all relate to this, those of us who are parents, this is supposed to be 3 a.m. These are the mysterious noises. And because I have two kids, when I'm faced with this situation, or when I was faced with this situation, I was essentially faced with a two alternative decision about who was making those noises. Was it my younger son or was it my older son? And to make the most accurate decision in this scenario, it helped to sit and listen to the sounds for a period of time and essentially accumulate evidence for each of these two different alternatives. For instance, if I heard something that sounded more like crying, that would favor my younger son as the source. And if I heard something that sounded more like sneaking a cookie from the kitchen, that would favor my older son as the source. And the more sounds I would listen to, the better my accuracy would be in making a correct determination in this scenario. Much of the research in my lab has focused on trying to understand how the brain supports these sorts of decisions that require the combination of evidence over time. We address these sorts of questions using two primary model systems. The first model system that we use is the common laboratory rat, pictured here. The main reason that we use lab rats is the wealth of techniques that we have at our disposal to measure and manipulate brain activity in these animals. Techniques I'll tell you about in more detail in a moment. These rats also have sophisticated enough behavior to allow us to ask questions about decision making that we're trying to address in the lab. In addition to using common laboratory rats, the other main subject that we use is the common undergraduate student, also <laughs> readily available on campus. Uh, more seriously, the reason why we use human subjects, not just undergrads, is that ultimately what we care about is human brain function. And so while all the tasks that we use in the lab are simple enough for rats to perform, we always relate that performance to human behavior. That said, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on research that we've conducted with these little guys, our rat subjects. Again, the reason that we use rats are the techniques that we have available with them. And one of these techniques is the ability to measure brain activity. So for those of you who don't know, 
Nerve cells or neurons in the brain primarily communicate over long distances using electrical signals called action potentials, each of these large deflections here in these blue traces at the bottom. And we have the ability to eavesdrop on these electrical action potentials, the messages being sent by these neurons while animals are making decisions. The other main technique that we use in the lab stems from a revolution that's occurred in neuroscience over the last 10 years with the development of a set of methods called optogenetics. Optogenetics is a set of tools that allows us to alter brain responses using light. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of this except to say that it really does sound like science fiction. And even if you know how it works, it still sounds a bit like science fiction. But it really does work. Here's an example of it working in practice here, an experiment I conducted. Using light here in this period in green, I've completely abolished these large deflections, the action potentials that I told you about from this figure here on the left. This technique also allows us, in addition to reducing responses, to increase responses, and in general gives us exquisite control over brain responses. And so in broad strokes, these are the set of methods that we apply in my lab. And we apply these methods, again, to try to understand how the brain supports decision making in these animals. In order to do that, the way we start is by training animals on simple decision-making tasks. I'm going to walk you through one such example here. At the end, I'll show you a video of a rat performing the task, but first I'm going to walk you through the logic of the task. There are three stages moving from left to right across these figures. In the first stage, a rat is placed in a box with three nose ports, one on the left and one in the middle and one on the right. At the end of that stage, a light turns on in the center port, which cues the rat to poke its nose there. After it does, in the second phase, we have speakers on the left and right, so we have two different speakers. And the rat listens to sequences of sounds that are played by those speakers at different times for the two different sides. And the rat's task is to determine which side played the greater number of sounds. These sounds are just click-based sounds. You'll hear them in a moment if these speakers are working. And when this stage finishes, we turn off both the sounds and the light, which cues the rat to indicate its choice, which it does so by making a sideways movement, either to the right side or to the left side, and gets a water reward for correct responses. So to show you what this looks like in action, I'm going to show you a video of a rat performing two consecutive trials of this task. I'll also play the sound stimulus. You won't be able to distinguish left and right clicks from the speaker system. So for your convenience, I'll overlay on the video the side favored by the click. So let's see if this works. Here we go. After training, rats perform this task quite well. And critically, the task requires them to accumulate information over time. So the first question that we wanted to address is what areas of the rat brain are involved in that accumulation process for decision making? In general, the way that we address these questions is taking what we call a network approach, looking at the action of many brain regions working in concert together for these purposes. This is a very simplified overview schematic of a number of brain regions in the rat. This is a sideways view of the rat brain. This is the front. This is the back. This is obviously the top and the bottom. And this schematic highlights a few regions in particular, color coding them for broad functions. So these regions here more in purple are regions more closely associated with decision making in our tasks. And in general, those sorts of regions, in terms of their connections, are sandwiched between regions that are called sensory regions here in red and regions that are called motor regions here in green. The sensory regions are more closely associated with processing information about the world around us. The motor regions are more closely associated with the coordination and control of movements. And again, these decision-making areas seem to intervene between the two. To show you how they play a role, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on one brain region in particular, a region called the striatum right here in the middle of the rat brain. The striatum has long been known to be important for a number of dysfunctions of, of the brain, including Parkinson's, Huntington's, and even ADHD. And what we've been able to show is that the striatum is also important for combining information over time for decision making. I'm going to try to convince you of that by showing you an example that comes from this slide. 
Now this figure is a bit complicated, so I'm going to walk you through it slowly. And I think by the end, you'll get the basic idea. What I'm showing you here, these are neural responses in the striatum. And these are responses from neuro cells in the striatum that prefer rightward choices. I'm showing you those responses as a function of time while an animal is sitting there making a decision in the task that I just showed you a moment ago. So it's sitting there listening to those sounds, but has not yet indicated its choice. And I'm separating the trials into three different types. Here in green are trials where we've provided very strong rightward evidence. Most of the sounds are on the right side. This is a very easy decision for the animals. They always choose rightward. And what we see in the, in the responses of these nerve cells is that they ramp up very quickly. Here in the more orange-like color, we're providing weaker rightward evidence. It's a more difficult decision for the animals. And the neural response ramps up more slowly. And here in dark blue, we've provided no rightward evidence whatsoever. The animals are always choosing leftward. In this case, before the choice, the responses are not ramping up whatsoever. So in summary, here in the striatum, these responses, the higher they are, the more likely the animal is going to make the corresponding choice when it will indicate that choice in the future. And this is just a small part of a much larger experiment that we performed. But I hope it illustrates to you this particular interpretation of these results that these brain responses seem to be involved in the underlying decision-making process. Now, if these responses are involved in that process, we would predict that altering those responses could influence the animal's decisions. And that's exactly what we found. And I'm going to walk you through this one again, walk you through slowly. The first part of this is just showing you baseline behavior of the animals. They're performing the task. We're not doing any manipulation of brain activity at this point. And I'm showing you this behavior in a particular way. I'm showing you the proportion of rightward choices the animal makes as a function of the number of right sounds or right clicks minus the number of left sounds or left clicks. Positive values mean more rightward sounds here. Negative values mean more leftward sounds. And what you see is that when there are more rightward sounds, the animals choose right more frequently. When there are more leftward sounds, the animals choose right less frequently. They choose left more often. What happens when we alter brain responses in the striatum while the animals are making these decisions? Well, what we do is we influence their choices. We can cause them either to have fewer rightward choices with some sorts of alterations of brain activity, or we could cause them to have more rightward choices with other types of alterations of brain activity. And these alterations are using those optogenetic methods that I told you about earlier in the talk. Again, this is a small part of a much larger set of experiments that we performed. But I hope that it illustrates the ways in which we can use these cutting edge techniques to begin to reveal how different brain structures are involved in this complicated process of decision making. The last thing that I want to leave you with before taking questions is I want to tell you a little bit about work that we're doing that's more translational in nature, trying to pave the way towards the directed treatment of disorders of brain function. And the starting point of describing that is just the recognition that these tasks are challenging, even for human subjects. They demand a lot of attention, fitting in with what Steve talked about earlier. So if you try to perform this task and your attention wanders, your performance will slip. And this led us to the realization that these sorts of tasks are really well suited for studying differences or variability in attentional control. And based on that, we've been using rats engaged in this task to try to study attentional deficits. Within the context of this task, in addition to measuring inattention for individual animals, we can also measure impulsivity. And these are two of the three primary symptoms of ADHD. This shows measures that we get from a large population of 60 rats engaged in this task. Each of these individual data points is one individual animal. And what you see is that there's a large amount of variability in these animals across both of these two different measures, broadly matching the spectrum of severity of these measures found in human populations. And so what we're trying to do is to use these rats in combination with these cutting edge te te techniques that we have available 
to try to identify and evaluate potential targets that can reduce impulsivity and inattention in these animals. With the long-term goal of by finding targets in rats, we can then guide potential new treatments that can reduce those behavioral symptoms in human populations that suffer from them severely, including those with severe ADHD. Finally, before taking questions, I'd like to acknowledge the people who I have the good fortune to work with on a daily basis, the members of my lab pictured here. We have a strong team and we're really excited about the future promise of our research. Thank you very much. Is, is there any evidence at all that perhaps we'll go with a set of decision making tools, for example? Yeah, yeah your mic's not up. Is, is there any evidence that perhaps we're born with a set of decision-making tools, for example, perhaps uh, some sort of moral compass or some way to discern good or bad, or is, or is everything that we use in terms of making decisions a function of learning and, and the experiences that we have? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think it's a combination of the two. We, there's certain constraints in which we can make decisions, but one of the hallmarks of decision making is the flexibility that we have with decision making. That's really the cognitive component. And there's a great degree of flexibility that comes about from learning and our experiences. So I think that this, that's an absolutely critical component of what goes into our decision making processes. That's been well established. Now, obviously there's some constraints. There's constraints about the memory load that we can support which goes into our decisions. So broadly, there are some constraints that are set up by the architectures of the brains that we have. But within those constraints, there's a large amount of flexibility. It depends on experience and learning. Here you go. Here's the mic. Yes, I was wondering what role you see meditation playing in brain activity. Yeah, so medication is one of the primary tools that we have now to help with disorders of brain function. And like I said, it can be quite effective in, in certain circumstances. Depending on the nature of the medications, some of those medications are more targeted and some of those are less targeted. And so that was my analogy with changing the amount of salt you put in the dishes you make. There are, if, if there's some food item that you make that's really bad, you might want to increase the amount of salt even if it's going to cause small effects here and there. But if we could target things, then we could do even better. So I think medication has its role, and there's many places where it's used appropriately, but there's certainly better things that we could do that are on the horizon. Oh, sorry. Um, thank you, Tim. Uh, if you go back to the graph or the uh, diagram just before, when you talk about impulsivity, yes, can you define, because I was a bit lost about what that represent. This ah, is yeah. the inattention in index. Um, if you could explain that, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So in this case, within our task, inattention really comes down to what we call attentional lapses that are that is decisions that are made that seem not to be based on the information that's provided to the individuals. Impulsivity are premature responses. That is responding before all the information has been presented. So both of these lead to worsening of performance. Both of these are affected in individuals with ADHD. And we can measure both of these independently in our animals. So, so impulsivity really is about how willing you are to consider a large amount of information or the degree to which you consider more information before making a choice. If you make a decision that's more impulsive, that would be making a choice based on less information more quickly. If you gathered more information, you could improve your accuracy, improve performance, but it would require more time. Uh, to what extent is like uh, do emotion and environment take um, to what extent do those affect decision making uh, like in this would you say like in this context with the water and the, the noises yeah so the general the more general question is how much of decision making is context dependent and it is to a huge degree 
Even measures of impulsivity and inattention depend on the context. It depends on distractors. It depends on how engaged you are and interested in whatever it is that you're trying to do at the time. And I think this really gets back at the earlier question about the flexibility of decision-making processes. I think that flexibility allows us to change, change things in a context-dependent way, and it, all these factors really play a role. Yeah, so they're absolutely critical. Okay, thank you very much.